Our text this morning begins in Mark chapter 10, verse 13. Mark 10, 13. And before we begin reading, I just want to say a word in praise of providence. Because if you were here for the Bible class uh, earlier this morning, a lot of the things that are touched on in this reading from the gospel will sound very familiar. <laughs> so let's read together. And they were bringing children to him that he might touch them. And the disciples rebuked them. But when Jesus saw it, he was indignant and said to them, Let the children come to me. Do not hinder them, for to such belongs the kingdom of God. Truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. And he took them in his arms and blessed them, laying his hands on them. And as he was setting out on his journey, a man ran up and knelt before him and asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. Do not murder. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Do not defraud. Honor your father and mother. And he said to him, Teacher, all these things I have kept from my youth. And Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said to him, You lack one thing. Go sell all that you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come follow me. Disheartened by the saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. And Jesus looked around and said to the disciples, How difficult it will be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. And the disciples were amazed at his words. But Jesus said to them again, Children, how difficult it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. And they were exceedingly astonished and said to him, Then who can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, With man it is impossible, but not with God, for all things are possible with God. Peter began to say to him, See, we have left everything and followed you. Jesus said, Truly I say to you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or lands for my sake and for the gospel, who will not receive a hundredfold now in this time houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecutions and in the age to come eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and the last first. Let us pray together. O oh God, who knows us to be set in the midst of so many and great dangers, that by reason of the frailty of our nature we cannot always stand upright, grant to us such strength and protection as may support us in all dangers and carry us through all temptations. Thank you for this word that you have preserved from your holy gospel about Jesus our Lord. We pray that we take it to heart and that we understand it aright and that we live it out all our days. We pray through Christ our Lord. Amen. So we are in a part of Mark's gospel that contrasts heavenly thinking, heavenly living with worldly thinking and living. Right, thinking that's fit for the kingdom versus thinking that is not fit for the kingdom. Hardness of heart, which is concerned with one's own status and one's own well-being on the one hand, versus on the other hand what our Lord calls receiving the kingdom like a child. That is, being of no account for the sake of the kingdom of heaven, as we talked about a couple of weeks ago. And that is why today's gospel, it, it, today's gospel continues using some of the language that we've heard over the last couple of weeks. Uh, it continues to speak of children, continues to speak of last and first, greatest and least. And we're going to see Mark continues to do that over the next couple of readings. Right, at the tail end of today's reading, uh, in verse 24, Jesus exclaims, Children! 
how difficult it is to enter the kingdom of God, referring to his disciples as his children. And of course, the reading opens with a teaching about the need to become like little children in order to enter the kingdom. That is building on what we recently heard the Lord teach in chapter 9, verse 42. Whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him if a great millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea. And earlier in chapter 9, verse 36, he took a child and put him in the midst of them, and taking him in his arms, he said to them, Whoever receives one such child in my name receives me, and whoever receives me receives not me, but him who sent me. So if the lessons seem repetitive, if it sounds like we're up here beating a drum, well, it's because we are. Right? Because the Lord is beating this drum. We can certainly see it in today's reading that our Lord has had to repeat himself and he will have to continue repeating himself because as we're going to see in the coming weeks and as we will see this morning, even after all of this repetition, the lesson still won't have sunk in for the apostles. They still don't get it. And we can see that in today's reading because you remember that the Lord has taken up this child in his arms. He said, whoever receives one such child in my name receives me. But what's the first thing that we see the, the disciples doing at the beginning of today's reading in chapter 10, verse 13? We find them rebuking people, trying to turn people away for having brought their children to Jesus for a blessing. You would think, right, if both of their brain cells were rubbing together, <laughs> that they, they would figure out, right, Jesus has just taken a child and says, receive one such as this. You receive a child, you receive me, you receive the Father who sent me. You'd think that they would be able to connect that to not turning people away for bringing their children. But they've still not gotten the lesson yet. They've not figured it out yet. And so Jesus tells them in today's reading, not only must they receive children, they must themselves receive the kingdom as children. That is, again, being of no status, being of no account, humbling themselves, as we talked about in our Bible class this morning. Now, if we are willing to hear it, Jesus has been telling us what this means in different contexts. What, what does it mean to make yourself of no account, to humble yourself, that is, to become like a little child? What's it look like? What's it mean? It means, as we heard a couple of weeks ago, becoming last of all and servant of all, rather than seeking to be the greatest. In the context of marriage, as we heard last week, it means being faithful to your spouse rather than hardening your heart towards your spouse. Today we learn another example in the form of a rich man who comes to Jesus and asks what he must do to inherit eternal life. And Jesus gives him a fairly standard answer from the law of Moses. Keep the commandments. As it is written, those who do them shall live. Right? So he, he repeats the commandments. He says, do this. The rich man replies that he has indeed kept all of those commandments from his youth. Now Jesus doesn't call him out for overstating his obedience. So neither shall we this morning. Instead, Jesus tells him the one thing that he lacks. And that's what we're going to focus on today that he needs to sell his possessions, give to the poor, and follow Jesus as a disciple. Now again, set in its context, this story is teaching us about the kingdom, what it means to get into the kingdom and be part of the kingdom, what kind of person enters the kingdom. 
In fact, Jesus makes that pretty explicit in his follow-up later with his disciples. That this is ultimately about getting into the kingdom of God. This lesson about the rich man is about what it means to be last of all and servant of all. It is about the hardening and softening of hearts. It's about what it means to receive children and to receive the kingdom as children. Right? Jesus is asking this rich man to make himself poorer so that he can make the poor richer. He is asking him, in other words, to make himself of no account, to become last of all, become servant of all. Now, what is the reaction of the rich man to this teaching? That he must sell what he has, give to the poor, and follow Jesus. The teaching appalls the rich man. Our English translations have done us something of a disservice here. Um, it, our English translations render this guy's reactions too mildly. Right, the ESV says that he's disheartened by the saying and he goes away sorrowful. I think the King James says something like he's sad. It, it, it sounds like he's got this ho-hum response. Oh, well, I guess that's, mm, I can't do that. And he just, you know, kind of wanders off. You know, it sounds really ho-hum in English. The language of the gospel is stronger than that, if I'm understanding it correctly. The same language used here to describe this guy as being disheartened is used elsewhere to describe threatening storms. Right? Someone who's not just disheartened, but gloomy and glowering about it. The word rendered sorrowful here is used to describe the apostles' reaction to learning that one of them would betray Jesus. Right, were they ho-hum about that? It's the same word that is also used to describe Jesus' own grief in the Garden of Gethsemane. Was he ho-hum about that? No, he was bleeding out of his pores and out of his eyes. He was so upset and sorrowful. This guy, this rich man, is not just mildly disheartened by Jesus' teaching. He is upset and offended by it. And we're reminded of what Jesus taught at the end of Mark chapter 9. That if your hand or your foot or your eye scandalizes you, that is, if it's a cause of offense or a cause of sin, then get rid of it. That's precisely what Jesus has told the rich man to do. This is a practical application of that lesson about cutting off the hand and feet and plucking out the eye. His wealth has become a scandal to him, a cause of offense. And so he tells the rich man, get rid of it. But the offense is too great, and the rich man won't do it. He will not cut off his wealth to enter into life. He will not become last of all and servant of all by giving up his riches. He will not soften his heart towards those who are of no account, that is, towards the poor. He will not become of no account himself. And so, Jesus makes clear in the follow-up, after this guy has left, as, he, as Jesus is talking to his disciples, this rich man will not enter the kingdom of God. And the postscript to this encounter with the rich man makes it clear that wealth is not the only worldly thing that can stand between us and the kingdom. Now, there are all kinds of things that can give us worldly comfort, make us seem to be of some account in our own eyes. Houses, brothers, sisters, mothers, fathers, children, lands. And I don't think that's meant to be an exclusive list either. All right, this is not the list of the only things that will stand between a person and the kingdom of heaven. 
Instead, what we learn from this rich man is what it looks like when someone chooses to be thrown whole into hell rather than to enter into life lame or enter into life blind. You and I must do as Jesus said. Receive the kingdom as children. As people of no account. Because as our Lord reminds us once again at the close of today's gospel, many who are first will be last. And the last, first. We invite you this morning to make yourself of no account. That is the call of the gospel this morning. Humble yourself before God and before man. And there are all kinds of things that might be standing in the way for you. It might be wealth. It might be something else. God knows your heart. Hopefully, you know some semblance of it yourself. The gospel calls on all of us to humble ourselves in the sight of the Lord, become as little children, make ourselves of no account. We invite you to do that this morning but through obedience to our Lord. If you have not obeyed the gospel, believe in the good news of Jesus Christ, turn away from sin, confess Jesus as Lord, be baptized into his death, burial, and resurrection for the remission of your sins. If having done that, you're still magnifying yourself in your own sight and in the sight of the world, and you need to repent of something and feel the need to do so publicly, or if you want to request prayers from the congregation for that, we stand ready to help you, whatever your need may be. If you'll make your needs known by coming forward as together we stand and sing.